My name is David DeFerranti. I'm with 3IE. I'll be chairing this session on making sanitation sustainable in India. And the context by way of brief introduction before we come to our wonderful panel is that uh, as uh, almost everybody in this room knows, I'm sure the national government here in India has given priority uh, in recent years to achieving the goal of being open defecation free uh, and has made important statements about that uh, very recently, in fact, almost exactly a month ago. Also, the government's 10-year uh, national rural sanitation strategy for the next 10 years emphasizes its sustainability of latrine infrastructure, including retrofitting and repairs, behavior change, communication, and solid and liquid waste management will remain priorities uh, in the post-October 2019 uh, period. And uh, to um, help understand, help everyone look at uh, the uh, big questions around all of this, 3IE has been supporting the generation of evidence on sanitation interventions in the country, including uh, formative testing and impact evaluations on innovative low-cost behavioral science-informed interventions uh, in several states, Bihar, Gujarat, Karnataka, and Odisha, and uh, exploring um, the role of informational constraints in inadequate facilities and how they affect uh, the willingness to pay for access to community toilets and their use in the context of the slums in Uttar Pradesh. So, there's a big issue that's been in the public eye. Uh, there are uh, policymakers who are making decisions uh, and statements, and it's, uh, it's a moment for evidence to step forward. And let's, uh, in this session, we're gonna hear a little bit about all of that. And our distinguished panel, uh, in the order in which they will be speaking, uh, first, uh, Alex Armand, on my immediate uh, left, your right, is assistant professor at the Nova School of Business and Economics, a research fellow at the Institute uh, for Fiscal Studies in the UK, and at the Navarra Center for International Development in Spain. He, uh, his research is, uh, amongst other things, focusing on the effect of local community engagement on natural resource management, on the role of media in reducing conflict, and on sanitation in urban slums. Um, he will be followed by uh, Radhika Menon at the far uh, end, uh, who uh, is Senior Policy and Advocacy Advisor at 3IE. Radhika anchors 3IE's advocacy work on evidence-informed policymaking. She has over nine years of experience working in the area of uh, evidence-informed decision-making, knowledge translation, and uh, research communication. And if I listed all the things that she has done, and Alex has done, and uh, Maravian has done, we'd be into lunchtime. So uh, we'll, um, and now um, our third speaker, uh, uh, VK Madhavan, is Chief Executive of Water Aid Indi uh, India. Uh, and uh, he has uh, worked extensively around the country on um, many issues uh, uh, at, at the very ground level. Uh, he has worked with ActionAid, the Hunger Project, uh, the Central Himalayan Rural Action Group. Uh, he uh, has been a development professional, um, worked on integrated approach to rural development, uh, and um, uh, is now Chief Executive of Water Aid um, uh, since uh, 2016. So that's our panel. We come from all over. So uh, Alex, who's going to speak first, um, is from Italy, although his name doesn't sound it. I have an Italian sounding name. I don't come Italy from Italy, so we're all mixed up here. And uh, Alex, over to you. Thanks a lot for, for the nice introduction and for the opportunity to be here presenting uh, this work. Uh, this work is a collaborative effort uh, with uh, several institutions. Okay, so first of all, uh, the IFS in London, uh, which has been managing this uh, research side of, uh, of, of this project. 
uh, but together with Finnish, some, some of which are uh, the partners are here, uh, Morsel, and of course we have to acknowledge uh, the, the funding of this project from, uh, from FreeAE. Uh, let me start the presentation by looking at this map. So uh, this is a forecast from the United Nations about the growth of cities in, uh, in India uh, from nowadays, uh, well, including the past, but uh, out to 2035. And what is evident here is that the size of cities is planning to grow very fast in the next, uh, in the next 20 years. So even if we take um, you know, relatively smaller cities, and uh, I'm not choosing randomly because uh, it's basically uh, we'll be talking about the study which is being happening in these, uh, in these cities. So if you just take a relatively smaller city like Lucknow, uh, you can see that from 2015 to 2035, the city is expected to, uh, to double, almost double. Okay, so we're talking about a very large expansion in terms of uh, urbanization. Uh, urban slums are um, a result of this type of process. Okay, so the fact that uh, there is a large migration from rural areas into cities, which uh, turns up to increasing informal settlements. So worldwide, around 40% of this expansion is happening in areas with, uh, with basically low private and public investments. Uh, this translates into uh, generally an issue, so the fact that cities, uh, which are generally middle and lower uh, income countries, are generally struggling to, um, to maintain the pace of this urbanization in terms of, of infrastructure. Uh, one type of uh, infrastructure which is particularly important in this setting is the wash infrastructure. Okay, so the water sanitation and hygiene infrastructure. So this is particularly info important for the health consequences that uh, um, bad sanitation practices or bad access to uh, good sanitation infrastructure is, uh, is generating. So this creates, first of all, an important demand for uh, policies that works in terms of addressing uh, sanitation issues specifically in, uh, in slums. Okay, so this, in this study we focus on a particular type of solution which has been uh, thought to be potentially a temporary but not only a temporary solution which is the community toilets. Okay, so community toilets is somewhere in between a public toilet and, um, um, and a privately managed toilet. So it's a pay to use toilet which is mainly used by communities. Okay, so it's not, uh, it's not a toilet which is used by, uh, you know, in market areas or by people not living next to the community. Uh, this is an important solution basically for the constraints faced in slums on building and managing private toilets. Uh, but also it's a very important solution to face the proportion of people which is still uh, uh, practicing open defecation. Okay, so if we look at a uh, very simple correlation from, uh, from our study, so if we put on the y-axis the share of people using community toilets and on the uh, x-axis the distance from a community toilet, we can see that uh, the geographical pattern where, where you place a community toilet is particularly important for defining uh, usage. Okay, so if you live very close to community toilets, uh, and, and this is, sorry, I forgot to say, this is only for people who do not have access to private, uh, um, private toilet. So if you live very close to a community toilet, the probability of using it is very large. Uh, the, the further you move away, the lower is the probability. Okay, so I'm not saying that uh, where you put a toilet, people are going to start using it. Uh, but there is a clear correlation on uh, positioning a toilet and the fact that uh, uh, users are using it. So independently from the use or uh, access to a community toilet, this is particularly important because if you go the other way around and if you, use, if you look instead uh, open defecation practicing, uh, you can see that if you are very close to community toilets, then probability of uh, open defecating is very low. Uh, but the further you move away, uh, the probability of open defecating is going up to uh, almost to one. Okay, so um, still nowadays you can see that if you live around 400 meters away from a community toilet and if you don't have access to, privately, uh, to private owned uh, toilets, people are um, open defecating with a large, in large proportion. Okay, so this opens um, uh, several questions, but the main one is how can we make uh, community talents financially viable? Okay, so um, the main characteristic of community talents in, in uh, Indian slums is that these talents, while they are paid to use, they tend to be in very, very bad conditions. Okay, and the idea is that 
uh, if people do not pay fees, then it's very difficult to financially sustain toilets which are clean. And if the toilet per se is not clean, then it's more difficult for people to, uh, to be willing to pay more money to, to access the toilet. Okay, so in the literature, uh, the idea of uh, having uh, very low willingness to pay for environmental improvements, uh, which is widespread in uh, developing countries, also applies to, uh, to sanitation practices. Okay, so in, in general, we expect people to have very low willingness to pay to access improved sanitation uh, conditions. Okay, so in the literature, there's been uh, several type of uh, hypotheses, so some of which are people are not generally uh, informed about the returns in terms of health of uh, improving the, these, these practices, but also on the fact that there are not many, uh, well, the supply side is not uh, presenting enough conditions for which people uh, um, decide to, to pay or to use this type of, of, um, um, of toilets. Okay, so let me come to our study. So in our study, we want to understand how can we make uh, community toilets uh, financially viable or sustainable. And the idea here is to try to think about the effect of uh, improving the quality of the toilets, but at the same time providing information. Okay, so we designed and uh, implemented a randomized controlled trial in 110 slums in, uh, in Lucknow and Kampur. And the idea here is to use uh, these 110 slums and to randomly allocate them to three different groups. Okay, so a control group where uh, nothing is implemented, a supply side group where uh, there has been an improvement in the, in the quality or an attempt to improve the quality of these toilets, and the third group in which this attempt to improve quality is, a, is, a, is a joined together with an information campaign uh, on the importance of, uh, of uh, not practicing open defecation, but at the same time of um, respecting um, the community toilets. Okay, so we are, um, impl while implementing this, uh, this study, we collected different type of uh, wide range of uh, measurements. So we collected information on uh, households. At the same time, we collected information on uh, community toilets. And at the same time, we also measured uh, behavioral change. Okay, with, uh, and I will explain a little bit more about this uh, in a bit. Okay, so what do we mean by uh, supply side intervention? So how do we try to tackle improvements in the quality of uh, community toilets? So we designed two type of interventions here. So the first one is uh, that we call the CT grant scheme. We allowed caretakers to choose uh, what is best for the toilet. Okay, so we are externally funding a grant which allow caretaker to choose among three different uh, interventions, which is deep cleaning, uh, some improvements, which can be, for example, uh, improvement the, the, the water connection or infrastructure refurbishment, and a third type, which is the provision of uh, cleaning tools and, uh, and cleaning training. Okay, so this has been happening in the first, uh, as I will explain, the first two months of the project. Then after two months, we try to, uh, instead of focusing on, uh, on the main infrastructure, we try to incentivize the cleaning and the quality of, um, of the toilets by incentivizing the behavior of caretakers. So we basically designed a financial reward schemes where in every two months we collected data about the quality of the, of the community toilets and we paid caretakers depending on uh, the quality of the toilet. Okay, so this was designed based on three different uh, type of indicators. So the first one is availability of soap, uh, which would have been uh, rewarded with 500 rupees. Uh, the presence of uh, visible feces, which have been rewarded with 500 rupees, and um, we collected bacteria counts. So if bacteria counts was uh, lower than uh, a pre-specified standard, this would have been rewarded the caretakers with 1,000 rupees. Okay, so every two months for one year, we implemented this design, uh, which is uh, rewarding caretakers for up to one third of their monthly salary if, they, uh, if the quality conditions are respect it. Okay, so this was implemented in group two, the supply side. In the, in the third group, supply side, so this scheme was also accompanied by uh, an information campaign. Okay, so the, the information campaign, we tried to tackle three different points, uh, which was first implemented with the door-to-door -door, uh, campaign. So the, the three main points were, first of all, defining uh, how bad is to practicing open defecation. Second, explaining the benefits of using a community toilet in terms of uh, community, but also in terms of families. 
and also at the same time how can uh, uh, families can uh, what they can do in order to maintain uh, community toilets clean third uh, what are the rights when you pay what are the rights of uh, of uh, that you are basically purchasing okay so we implemented this with a door to door campaign uh, with the circulation of leaflets by posting some posters in the community toilets and by sending uh, voice messages through uh, mobile phones every every month okay so this is an example of the leaflet that we distributed in the uh, in the in the community okay so uh, first of all um, there is a as, as you might know there is a strong lack of uh, data especially about informal settlements in many cities of India okay so this is a specific case of Lucknow and the steps that we have we had to take in order to identify these specific areas. So this is a mapping of, uh, of slums, so informal settlements in Lucknow. So first thing you notice is that these are uh, widespread. Okay, some are smaller, some are larger. The second process we did was to map uh, community toilets. Okay, so these are community toilets which are paid to use and at the same time they're mainly served by, um, by the community. There was no pre-existing data on these toilets. Okay, so there were no data available on the location and on the characteristic of these toilets. The first step uh, to do was that we had no clue who was living uh, next to these toilets. So we performed a census of people living in the surrounding of these toilets. So for Lucknow, this is around uh, 10 to 15,000 uh, households. The fourth step was to randomly select it, uh, a sample of these households for the study. And the final step was to randomly allocating toilets into different groups. Okay, so where you see the, the purple toilets, these are communities where nothing was uh, implemented for, for one year. Where you see the blue toilets, this is where the supply intervention was implemented. And uh, the green ones is where the information and the supply side uh, were, was implemented. Okay, so in terms of timing, um, we collected information at baseline, so around June 2018. In the first two months, we implemented the grant scheme, so we allowed caretakers to choose in pre-specified pre pre areas uh, the grant that they were willing to implement. And then for month four, uh, we implemented the financial award scheme. And this has been implemented uh, until September, um, very recently, until September 2019. Okay, so let me come up with the, with the main results. So the first thing we were interested in is the willingness to pay for a community toilet's use. Um, so how did we implement this? So throughout the study, we tried to look at behavioral change. So we measure willingness to pay in an incentivized way. So we visited households. We offered uh, different type of uh, um, options, which is basically we, we were offering people to choose between a bundle of 10 tickets to access the toilet versus cash. And then by varying cash, we try to estimate uh, what, were, what was the willingness to pay. So after offering different type of, uh, of options, one choice was randomly drawn and paid to, uh, to the user. Okay, so the very first result, uh, which is uh, descriptive, is that uh, as we were expecting, the willingness to pay tends to be very low. Okay, so you, you have here the distribution of the willingness to pay. Uh, while the, the main price should, is supposed to be five rupees, on average people are willing to pay only a very small fraction of, the, of those five rupees, which is around 1.5 uh, rupees. So you see that the distribution is also kind of uh, uh, spread towards uh, zero, but you do have some people which are willing to pay uh, five rupees. Some people are also actually willing to pay even more than five rupees. Then in terms of uh, impact, the fact that uh, community toilets were randomly allocated into different groups allow us to compare the willingness to pay at the end of the study in order to understand whether one or the other treatment or intervention is indeed generating any, any impact. Okay, so in this graph we are showing the change uh, in terms of willingness to pay with respect to the control group. Okay, so with respect to the group which is not receiving, um, receiving, receiving anything. And we measure these at three points in time. So after two months, which is after the grant scheme is implemented, uh, after the six months, which is uh, indicated by midline, and at end line, which is 12 months 
after the introduction of the project. Okay, so what you see here is that what we would expect is not exactly what we observe. Okay, so while we should see that improving quality of toilets should increase the willingness to pay for, uh, for accessing, what we see is that in the short run, uh, if any, the willingness to pay is actually uh, reduced. And uh, this is also showing that once we introduce instead the financial reward scheme for, uh, for caretakers to improve their quality, this effect is going back to zero. Uh, it's slightly positive, but not different uh, from zero. So this leads to a very first uh, lesson we learned from this, which is uh, we can define as crowding out. Okay, so what we see is that, at least in, in, in this study, so external intervention which are aiming to improve the quality of community toilets by, uh, you know, by improving the infrastructure are not uh, raising willingness to pay, but if any, they're reducing it. Okay, so this is known in, uh, in economic as a crowding out effect. So the fact that coming in with public or external investment tends or can reduce uh, private um, contributions. Okay, so the, the first lesson from this is that uh, any intervention that should try to implement um, improvements in community toilet quality should think about this crowding out uh, effect. At the same time, what we see is that uh, policies targeting improvements in the way we try to uh, implement are definitely not financially viable. Okay, so the fact that we try to improve quality and then lead to an improvement in uh, willingness to pay for, um, for accessing, it's something that we not observe. So trying to improve the quality by raising willingness to pay, it's something that is not uh, observed. At the same time, this is also rational for subsidies. Okay, so the fact that individuals are willing to pay very little amount of money for uh, accessing community toilets, but at the same time, uh, improving sanitation has very large private and public returns, it's definitely um, irrational for external subsidies. So let me move on to a second type of lesson we, we observe from this. So a second type of measurement, which is more, again, uh, also behavioral, which is not coming from surveys, uh, we, we, we were aiming at trying to understand what is the demand for, um, for public or for political intervention in terms of, um, of city quality. So what we did is to visit the slums and distribute cards where people could have reported what was the main issue, they were uh, allowed to report only one, what was the main issue in the slum uh, to be reported to the, to the local officers. Then after we collected, um, we were promising in the, in, the, in the leaflet to collect preferences and distribute them to the, to the public officers, which is what, uh, what we did. Okay, so what we observe here is where we implement the, supply, where we implement the interventions. Uh, people, as we've seen, they reduce, their, they reduce or they maintain their willingness to pay, but at the same time, they start demanding uh, attention for policymakers in a much more relevant way. So we observe that where we implement intervention, 5% more as compared to control group tends to report uh, dirtiness of the community toilet as the main issue in the, in the, in the, in the slum. And I'm not going to have time to, to go through this, but as you can see, uh, people report a lot of issues. Okay, so it's important to notice that where the interventions are happening, people start demanding more for uh, public intervention. Which leads to the second uh, uh, lesson from this study, which is the coordination pro problem. Uh, it is clear that privately-oriented solution in this case uh, um, suffer from a coordination problem. So uh, policies which aims are targeting this issue needs to take into account two things, uh, which is, uh, first of all, they should raise coordination among slum dwellers, or in the other way around, they should think about uh, punishing in some way uh, the free riders, because these are two clearly missing uh, points in, uh, in this type of setting. And we also observed that information campaign which raise the importance of behaving as a community or the importance of uh, maintaining community toilets clean as a benefit for the community are not really uh, working in, uh, in this setting. So final thing I wanted to uh, cover and then I will, uh, I, will, uh, I will conclude. We do observe two main other uh, facts here. Uh, the first thing we observe is where we implement the intervention, we see an increase by 5 to 10% in, 
in the share of people which are paying the fees to access the community toilets. Uh, this is done not by asking, but it's done by observation. So we basically have uh, observers uh, checking how many people are paying. So it looks like financially rewarding caretakers allows to increase revenues for the community toilets. Uh, but at the same time, we don't observe any effect on usage. So there's no more users. And at the same time, we don't observe uh, cleaning efforts. Okay, so the only real effect on uh, uh, incentivizing uh, caretakers is basically raising, uh, um, raising revenues. At the same time, which is probably driven by the uh, incentive by the information campaign, we do observe a three to four percent increase in uh, people reporting washing their hands. So basically, um, improving sanitation um, hygiene con hygiene practices. Uh, this leads to a third type of uh, inter uh, lesson. Which is relating to targeting. Okay, so in our study, we try to target uh, caretakers are, as the main channel through which improving quality of, uh, of um, community toilets by basically targeting their efforts. Okay, so we see that this is not really working in this setting in order to maintain um, community toilets clean. So it could be that there is limited limited control of caretakers in the way uh, slum dwellers behave, but also limited uh, amount of resources for them in order to control uh, cleanliness of, um, of the toilets, uh, which leads to the fact that incentivizing cleanliness through uh, the behavior of caretakers uh, doesn't really translate into improved qualities, but uh, does translate into uh, increased revenues, which is uh, some sort of, of a perverse um, mechanism which doesn't guarantee the, the fact that uh, community toilets will improve their, their quality. Okay, so this is, uh, this is it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, um, Alex. Uh, you, you've given us your findings, uh, which include uh, that uh, several hypotheses are not supported. That's very important. And also some um, um, other effects, such as hand washing, turned out to be positive for those in the room who work in health. Hand, hand washing is believed to be extremely important. Let's go. We'll come back to these issues. Let's go on now to... Um, Radhika. So diving right in, and I think David provided uh, some sort of introduction to this program that we set up back in 2016 when India was in the throes of the Swachh Bharat mission. We thought this was an opportune time to have this program. When we carried out a scoping study, we actually found there were very few rigorous studies that were looking at latrine use. Um, so we supported nine pilots of behavioral science informed interventions. And from that, we chose for research teams to carry out impact evaluations. The aim of this program was to generate evidence on the effectiveness of low-cost behavioral science informed interventions to improve latrine use, and we capped it, the cap, the cost of the intervention at $1.20 per household, which is in line with the information education communication budget of the government. Uh, so the studies were carried out in Bihar, Odisha, Gujarat, and Karnataka, uh, and they used different intervention approaches, which drew from actually different behavioral theories, but also was informed by the formative testing work, which actually showed that the barriers to latrine use were very different across these states. Uh, what was really key in this, in this program was that all of the research teams had a very collaborative approach, and they used a standard list of latrine use questions and indicators, so there's, you know, we can be looking across, study, and comparing. Uh, three I on its part had regular workshops through, uh, you know, the conduct of these studies uh, to promote peer learning and also to promote engagement with WASH stakeholders, including the government. So I'm going to take you to a whirlwind tour on the, of these interventions because there's really no time. Uh, so starting with Bihar, this drew on nudge-like principles, but I would say it was more than nudges. It was more of a push. Um, at the community level, uh, they had different sorts of activities. And the formative research here showed that 
anxiety about pit filling and emptying prevented people from using the toilet regularly. So they had facilitators ca carry out what is called a French drain experiment, which is a bucket full of holes where you show like wet mud rapidly losing volume as it decomposes. And the facilitators handled, uh, you know, decomposed fecal matter to show that it really doesn't have any sort of odor and it can be used as fertilizer. They also had a card game which demonstrated the pit filling rate for a standard pit for households of different sizes. And they got the community together to pledge that they would use latrines. The household visits reiterated those messages, had card games, and also a poster where this pledge was put out. There was a calendar that households could use to track you know, uh, household usage of different members, and a lockbox where they could put away money for repairs of the latrines. In Odisha, they, um, you know, again used all of these activities to promote awareness on, uh, you know, the benefits of latrine use. Uh, but they used folk dance performance like the palla to reinforce these messages. They went on a transect walk where they dropped colored, for, you know, powder on, you know, feces, and they brought the community together to have like a planning meeting to take stock of the cleanliness of the village and promote this idea of keeping the, you know, village clean and beautiful. Uh, they put out posters outside the you know, households which were regularly using the latrine to encourage people. And the wall painting also showed, indicated those households which were regularly using the latrines and there was an action plan on the wall. The household activities again reiterated these messages. And in addition, they had conducted minor latrine repairs. So the door not functioning or like minor pan repairs were carried out. And at you know, they also had mothers group meetings to promote the safe disposal of child feces and they gave away free potties to the mothers. In Karnataka, they drew on the RANAS framework, which is uh, looking at risks, attitudes, norms, abilities, and self-regulation influencing behavior. Um, and again, they try to promote awareness on latrine use, uh, about pit filling and emptying, and they had a meeting which used a lot of multimedia components, including videos, to tell stories. Again, reiteration of the messages through household visits. A reminder sticker was put on a lota, which is the water container used in the latrines. There was a phone call made to the male member of the household to remind them to use the latrine and check on whether they were using the latrine. Uh, and a commitment poster with a family, uh, with the family together pledging was put outside the, the house. And again, they had an Anganwadi meeting here to promote safe disposal of child feces. And finally, Gujarat, which used behavior-centered design, which as you may know, combines environmental and evolutionary psychology with best practice marketing uh, to you know, promote the idea of latrine use here, where they had a campaign where they went street after street promoting this idea, but they used a lot of multimedia, including virtual reality, where people could actually experience entering a five-star toilet. So it's a, a beautiful toilet, and I wouldn't mind that myself, uh, which has light and ventilation and beautiful tiles, um, and you know, a compost guessing game where they had jars filled with, you know, decomposed fecal matter, pebbles, and stones, so people couldn't distinguish to show that it, it actually is odorless, and certificates and stickers to people who own these sort of five-star toilets. Uh, household visits, again, reiterating some of those messages. Now, what are the findings? The findings actually showed that these interventions had small positive effects in Karnataka, Odisha, and Gujarat, and it was a statistically insignificant effect in Bihar. But what you actually see is this big surge in latrine use that's being caused by the Swachh Bharat mission. Now, the research teams concluded that it, the small effects for these behavioral interventions is probably because of the frequency and dosage of these interventions. And also, it was really dis difficult to disentangle the effects of the Swachh Bharat mission, given that people could often not recall what was the intervention, what was the Swachh Bharat activity. But as you can see, if you just look at the control group, this, you know, just look at Karnataka, it's jumped from 77 to 92. That's a 15 percentage point increase. And then the intervention has led to a 5 percent more increase. So this big surge of Swachh Bharat mission activity, which is not surprising, uh, but also some of the qualitative research showed that there were coercive activities going on in villages where people were fined or shamed if they were not using the latrine or they were threatened with being deprived of their job cards or, or ration cards if they were not using the latrine. 
What were some of the barriers to latrine use? In Bihar, we found that the reasons for not using the latrine, including lack of latrine at the workplace, especially if you're working on a farm, uh, convenience, which is sometimes because you're just you know, it's, it's a habit to go out in, in the open, but also because for low-income households, as many as five households may be using one latrine, uh, issues related to water, faulty toilet infrastructure, and again, this anxiety that the pit would become full. But what you see with these barriers is it's a mix of both structural and behavioral barriers. Um, and in Karnataka, again, you see similar barriers, but also this element of seasonality, that there's less water available in the summer, and hence you, may, uh, you are less likely to use latrines in the summer. Uh, latrine use by sex, you, in, in Odisha, we find that latrine use among women was significantly higher than the men. In Bihar, it was, the female use was slightly higher. Uh, and qualitative research in Bihar again shows that men actually gave preference for female household members and the elderly, and they felt that they were most in need of the latrine and they could go out in the open. Again, for men, it was more convenient to go out in the open, if, particularly if they were on a farm, uh, and, if, and it was also a matter of habit. So the intervention that looked at safe child feces disposal, there were two of them in Odisha and Karnataka. What's really interesting is there was a 20% increase in the reported safe disposal of child feces in Odisha, but no effect in Karnataka. Now the first thing I concluded was maybe giving free potties to people was what did it, but actually that's not what did it. The potties, kids fought over it, it was not suitable for children of different ages, it, it was difficult to clean. So it, actually it was the information and guidance provided in those meetings that was uh, possibly a barrier which, which was addressed with this intervention, but then no effect in Karnataka, which, which leads us to conclude that barriers in these states may be different, or maybe it was an implementation issue. Uh, in Bihar, there were several interesting findings on uh, you know, unsafe pit emptying practices. So households were not clear on safe disposal. In fact, they were emptying the pits when the waste was still wet. Uh, most, the, most of the de-sludgers actually transported the wet waste uh, onto an open field, uh, which again really undercuts the public health benefits of latrine use. What's the point of promoting latrine use if all of this is being dumped, pathogenic material is being dumped on an open field? Uh, and the people employed to empty these pits most often belong to a specific lower caste, which again reinforces this issue of caste-based pit emptying, which, which has remained a challenge in many states in India. We had an independent latrine use uh, measurement project. Um, as you know, latrine use is, measurement is prone to self-reporting bias and, and, and several inaccuracies. So if you ask someone whether they use a the toilet, they're more likely to say yes, because this is extremely private behavior. And often the questions are asked to a household, so the household level questions don't really capture the variation uh, between household members. So what we did is amongst a subsample uh, you know, of the population in all of these uh, study areas, we tested both a household level question and an individual level question. So the individual level question which we put together was what we thought was a balanced question because it had a priming statement, it offered two options, and also it referenced a specific recall period. So I've seen that some people defecate in the open and some people use the latrine. Now I want to ask about where you and family members defecate the last time so-and-so defecated in the open or used the latrine, so give them options. And compared it to the National Family Health Survey question, which assumes people use the toilet and just ask what kind of a toilet facility do members of your household usually use, and going out in the open, as you see, is just the 12th option. And we found that actually the individual level balanced latrine use question finds significantly higher rates of open defecation than the household level question. Finally, in terms of the lessons learned. So yes, these ideas seemed really good on paper, but some of them did suffer from implementation challenges. For instance, in Karnataka and Bihar, people found it really embarrassing to keep any latrine related materials in the house, so they threw it away. It's not surprising. So it sounds like a good idea on paper when you are you know, mot having these motivation campaigns, but it may not work. Gender-related social norms prevented young women from attending community meetings in Odisha. So for instance, the mother's group meetings were attended by the mother's-in-law and not the, you know, the mother herself. 
And overall, we found that participation in community meetings was not very high. Part of the problem is a mobilization effort that you need to bring the entire community together. But the other problem is also how a community perceives a community. They may not see, they, there may be tensions within the community and they may not subscribe to this collective idea of one unified community and it may not be you know, how the administrative definition of communities are. Finally, implications for policy and programming. We do feel that you know, to promote consistent and sustained literary use, uh, we need to move beyond you know, the traditional information, education, communication approach to think, to draw on behavioral science to actually think about what are some of the context specific, gender specific or subpopulation specific behavioral determinants. Uh, but also to improve health outcomes, we need to move beyond literary news and think about the safe disposal of child feces and fecal sludge management. In fact, we found in our studies that the sample shows that there's an overwhelming number of single pit latrines, which again raises this big issue of you know, fecal sludge management. And given I mean, all of this conversation in the morning, many factors influence outcomes, and it's really important that we be building these linkages with other programs like nutrition and government is already going the waterway as you can see the numerous factors that influence literary news so building those linkages are is important and again the focus should be on the most disadvantaged populations because the study findings show that though there are many though who do still don't have access and um, there are still those who are engaged in manual scavenging work and this is both an ethical and livelihood issue and just finally, to acknowledge the work of these research teams, and I'm just summarizing their work, actually. Our thought partner, Research Institute for Compassionate e Economics, funding from the Gates Foundation, and all the implementing agencies and research partici participants without whom these studies would not have happened. Thank you. Thank you, Radhika. Um, the, the, we're racing against the clock. Now we've heard two perspectives from the research side. Let's turn now, Madhavan, uh, what are the key takeaways, you as Chief Executive Officer of WaterAid, with a, a long uh, experience uh, on the action implementation, what, what do you bring, uh, as, what do you hear in, in these presentations and, and in uh, your thoughts on the whole issues? Thank you, I think they were both great summaries of the work that's happened, thanks Alex and uh, Radhika. I think uh, on, if I were to look at the issue of community toilets and slums, uh, I think what's clearly recognized now across the country is that our largest problem with regard to community toilets is operation and maintenance. Uh, there is the inability to actually ensure that these toilets are maintained continuously over a period of time. Uh, and Alex's study seems to suggest that it's not just a supply side issue, uh, you also need coordinated efforts to bring in communities to get them involved in the management of that facility if you hope to see better results. Some of the other learnings that we're starting to see as a consequence of not finding a way out of this mess that we find ourselves in is that people are starting to look at experiments around the structuring of payments. Uh, does a daily payment uh, make sense or is it better to look at a monthly payment uh, where families then you, you restructure the way that you have payments for use uh, and whether that has an implication in terms of improved usage. The second is in recognition of the fact that in most communities we're not seeing adequate willingness to pay to be able to maintain the facility adequately. As a consequence, there is a recognition that you need to have other sources of revenue to be able to maintain your toilets effectively. And I think some interesting work is starting to happen in the country about other possible revenue models uh, which can lead to revenue which can then add to operation and maintenance of these community toilets, which is not limited to what's coming from the community. So for example, we know of uh, in Pune, for example, they've tried to look at uh, retrofitting or completely redesigning the community toilet and to create public spaces in those community toilets. So you have a community library, for example, uh, you've found the space and set up an ATM machine. Now in India, uh, you'd rarely find someone defecating or urinating close to an ATM machine. Uh, and so it's, it's looking at what happens when you start to set up an ATM in your community toilet. 
Similarly, notions about libraries, you know, um, uh, and therefore having a community library adjacent to your toilet complex, community toilet complex. So one's starting to see innovations around how you redesign that space and to see whether cultural norms will then start to influence behaviors more than merely just payment. But having an ATM machine is a good source of revenue, which is that you know, banks are willing to pay for uh, real estate and community toilets are good locations for it. I think the last question on the slums uh, issue was also about, uh, we're now starting to see also whether from a management perspective, having other ways of collecting information about these toilets um, and, and, and particularly the use of technology for keeping track of operation and maintenance. So simple devices to track number of users who are actually using a facility and then to have a pre-designed uh, response in terms of maintenance immediately after a certain number of people have used the facility. To look at use of sensors, for example, in terms of emissions inside the toilet, to then try or water levels in the uh, toilet facility to decide on when uh, a maintenance activity needs to take place. But I think we've not, we're far from being able to solve for the problem. Uh, so in some sense, I, I was hoping that Alex would have a silver bullet at the end of the research study which could uh, uh, crack our problem, but uh, well, we're still dealing with complexity here. You know, to go up to uh, Radhika's uh, presentation, I, I think it's important to, to sort of, uh, at the outset, look at two or three things that have happened with Swachh Bharat mission. Uh, one is very interestingly, uh, there are a couple of things that they strategically decided not to focus on. One I know for a fact that they, as a strategy, decided to ignore, which was the question of access to water influencing toilet usage. Um, and they decided that they couldn't deal with promoting uh, sanitation and providing water access at the same time, and so they decided not to address the water question. But interestingly, other policymakers who were in, involved with informing government uh, or, in, or you know, sort of supporting government early on, their response was show us the evidence that suggests that access to water in a toilet leads to greater usage. And I was horrified that actually there were, there were actually no studies done. It seems so logical that actually no one's gone out and studied this. And so now we then have studies which say that usage goes down because you don't have water. But no one's looked at access to water improving usage and therefore the government could just adopt tunnel vision, focus on sanitation, not worry about water access. The two other things that they decided which were completely missed out as part of Swachh Bharat mission was this emphasis on hygiene behaviors. And we're actually left with a second order problem which is that you've got toilets, you might have people using them, you don't know whether that's, there's, uh, there's been an investment in hygiene behaviors. So if you're going to use a toilet, but you're still not going to adopt hygiene behaviors, the health benefits that you would possibly expect to gain from might not even accrue to you. So hygiene behavior was not something that the campaign looked at. The third was this whole question of disposal of child feces under the age of two, was just never part of the larger discourse around Swaj Bharat mission. We've also ended up with some very interesting uh, learnings from Swachh Bharat Mission. One is this whole question of toilet design. Uh, it's not just enough to have toilets, but it's also important to get the right kind of toilet in the right ecology. Late on, a fair, a two and a half years into the campaign, the government decided to look at what they call twin leech pit toilets, and so the French train experiment that was used in Bihar basically is around the twin uh, leech pit toilet. And the twin leach pit toilet, our experience now seems, in retrospect, seems to suggest that from a community perspective is akin to a black and white television, color television problem. Which is that we find that as people get economically better off, they choose what they consider septic tanks rather than twin leach pit toilets. Similarly, if you're upper caste, you're more likely to choose a septic tank, or what you consider a septic tank, rather than a twin leach pit toilet. And, f and so it's a classic black and white color television problem, which is that you think that because your twin leach pit actually has gaps in the pit which allow the water to soak out, it's an inferior design. And so we've not been able to convince people that actually this design 
in many parts of the country is, a, is an on-site sanitation solution, uh, and neither was the government able to convince people to do this. And, and so what we're going to end up is with second order problems where you have very large number of toilets constructed, but because the design itself of the toilets is poor, you're then either going to have a backflow, which could potentially adversely impact on usage in the future, or you're going to have to deal with questions around how that fecal matter is now emptied out, collected, transported, and safely treated. So rural fecal sludge management is going to become a very big challenge because of the problem of toilet design that we've ended up with. I think there's a larger question that we're dealing with here, which is that are surveys the best way to actually collect information on usage? Uh, uh, government collects, uses surveys to collect information on usage. Uh, one, one of the interesting things about Swachh Bharat Mission is that most studies reveal that usage rates are very, very high. Uh, and in some sense, we're seeing much higher usage rates in India, uh, you know, in India than we have in other parts of the world. But the fact of the matter is that survey design itself is not probably the best way to collect information on usage. The other problem is that surveys are also not, currently are not good ways to collect information about toilet design. Because your toilets have been constructed, you're trying to ask questions about the substructure, it's very difficult for people to be able to explain what the substructure looks like. So in some sense, I think there's a need for finding new ways of collecting information on some of this to be able to sort of inform decision making as we go along. You know, one of the things that I would like to mention, which I think is not just limited to sanitation, but you know, if you look at the evidence from the study that Radhika talked about, where you have very high proportion of women using toilets, I think one of the things that we've sort of missed out in the narrative of the first term of this current government, which was 2014 to 2019, is that across a large number of social or programs meant particularly for rural populations, a lot of them were specifically targeted on women. So this whole thing about financial inclusion largely looked at women. The whole question around gas, improved access to gas, looked at women. The question around sanitation largely ended up targeting women. In the, in the current, uh, term of the government, you already have this announcement about pipe water supply at a household level. There again, primary beneficiaries are likely to be women. And the question is that, has someone found a vote bank that's powerful out there, that's going to vote for you year in, year out? Uh, is that the grand design, uh, which is that you, know, you have women? Because at the end of the day, women turned around and said, it doesn't matter whether the toilets necessarily function. For the first time in our life, we have a toilet. And it mattered to them. And they're going to do exactly the same thing once they have a pipe water connection at their household level. So I think one's also got to start to recognize that I think it's not surprising that women, uh, you know, usage has been much higher because there was a special emphasis to promote this also amongst women. I'm just going to end with sort of saying that, you know, with regard to sanitation, we're still outside of the problem of community toilets. We're also going to have to deal with issues around uh, retrofitting of toilets on scale. We're going to have to deal with questions around rural fecal sludge management. Uh, we still have a problem of the last mile. Uh, and so this 10-year sanitation policy does talk about reaching those who have not been reached as yet. But we need to recognize that historically targeting has been a problem for all government schemes. And Swaj Bharat Mission didn't fix that uh, or wasn't even expected to fix that. So this last mile issue is going to continue to confound us in the days to come. And the last is in some sense Poor toilet design, not having a rural fecal sludge management policy is only going to perpetuate uh, manual scavenging and sanitation workers. And I think we need to recognize we're staring that in the face at this point of time. Thank you. Thank you, Maravan.